From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Before the break, Manet was talking about unintended consequences, and I think that's the right way to think about this. I mean, one thing you could see and probably will see is prices at fast food restaurants going up, and you will probably hear complaints, uh, including from some of the Democrats who passed this bill, that it's too expensive to go out to eat, to feed a family these days. You may see more automation and fewer jobs because when you look at labor costs, $22 $22 an hour minimum wage at these establishments that the commission could put in place. We don't know yet for sure that it will, how high it will go. But when you look at a figure like that, then suddenly the calculation of whether it makes sense to put in automated ordering systems, iPads at every table and so forth, suddenly that calculation looks a little bit different. And some of these establishments may decide that they simply can't operate under these new rules. They have to shut down in which case you will probably hear more complaints about food deserts, neighborhoods where there are not establishments that are selling food for sale. And Alicia, it strikes me that the conceit here is that the legislature can look at the economy and turn one dial left or right on a certain set of establishments and nothing else will change. And that's just not how the economy operates. And one point that struck me from our editorial on this is that there's going to be also effects on other industries because the fast food industry competes for workers with uh, hotels and retail establishments, stores, hardware stores, big box stores, also other restaurants. Other restaurants need labor, need servers and stuff. And so talk a little bit about how you foresee these unintended consequences playing out now in California as this commission on fast food gets started. I want to point out also that there's a certain irony that the fast food has actually been grown during the pandemic. So employment in the fast food industry in California has grown or is now above where it was pre-pandemic levels, while overall leisure and hospitality jobs in the broader industries, hotels, restaurants, has not returned. And one of those reasons is because more people during the pandemic or taking out food or going to fast food and they couldn't do sit down dining. But it is definitely a growth industry. Now, back to Manet's point, progressives don't like the fast food industry. And so they would actually be fine if a lot of these places disappear. They think fast food is unhealthy. And uh, to the extent that they are employers in these low income communities, they were just contributing to the problem, obesity, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So if these jobs and these restaurants shut down, they would be perfectly fine with that. And then perhaps they believe that, well, maybe better or establishments, you know, healthier establishments will come in and fill their place. I don't think that's necessarily would be the case. Entrepreneurs have to consider supply and demand, and there may not actually be the demand for these other, you know, more healthy foods in these locations. I know that may sound a little condescending, but in many cases, that's true. Now, the broader effects of the bill, as you pointed out, and I would be particularly worried about if I were Governor Newsom, is the effects on other industries. If all of a sudden they have to pay more to compete and to draw workers, their labor costs are going to go up. And many of them are going to struggle to find these workers. There's already an enormous labor shortage, including in California, despite its lockdowns that really kind of suppress the economy. And so wages have already been increasing pretty rapidly at these lower skilled jobs. You know, the couriers who are delivering food delivery workers, all of a sudden they're going to have to pay probably more than $22 an hour to attract workers. I think Amazon right now pays between about $17 and $20 per hour for those food delivery workers, for those who take the groceries from their fresh locations to your home. They're going to have to start paying more, which means the prices that people pay for their Amazon groceries are going to go up. This is just going to contribute to higher prices in the state and probably cause some small businesses who can't afford to pay the higher prices, Amazon probably can, to leave and to go to other states. And we've seen this before with the state's AB5 law basically use the similar kind of ham-handed mechanism to force employers to reclassify independent contractors as employees. And the result of that has been actually a lot of independent contractors, particularly truckers, have left the state, which contributed, if you recall, to the porch slowdown. There just weren't enough these truckers to deliver the goods that were piling up at the ports. 
So as you mentioned, laws always have unintended consequences. Some of these are actually intended. I think one of the points of the bill was actually to force wage increases at other employers. But again, this will have unintended consequences in terms of both the labor supply and the actual growth of, you know, the the business growth in the state. I think California often takes for granted that because it has gorgeous natural beauty and, you know, it is a mild and balmy climate that people will continue to live here and work here. But that won't be the case forever. Uh, You're already seeing population slow down and actually population decline in the last couple of years as foreign immigration has declined and more and more hundreds of thousands of people are actually leaving the state. And that's partly because of the high cost of living, not just taxes, but really the high cost of living between housing and energy. And this is just going to increase the cost of living even more. But the gamble that Governor Gavin Newsom seems to have made here, and he is widely rumored to be potentially interested in a presidential run in 2024, or maybe later, the gamble he seems to have made is that it was worth signing this bill rather than vetoing it and angering the progressives and Democrats in Sacramento who passed it originally. And that's the final thing, Manet, that strikes me here is the dilution of political accountability. Because remember, the legislature could have just passed a higher minimum wage for fast food restaurants, defined however they want it, with carve-outs for facilities that bake bread and so forth. But what they've done instead is they've created this 10-member council, and they're going to put the the real decision-making power in the council's hands. And so if there are these side effects, if people become upset about the increased food prices at these chains that they like, or if the chains go out of business and they no longer have access to that and are angry about it, it has given the legislature, the state lawmakers, and Governor Newsom a way to say, I wasn't my doing. I supported the council. I think the council went too far in raising wages to $22 an hour or what have you. But the people who really made the decision can't be fired by the voters. Oh, that's right. So I can already picture the way that Gavin Newsom is going to describe this decision down the road, no matter how the effects of the policy shake out. So I think it's very clear that on the upside, he'll be able to campaign, whether that's at home in California or in a potential presidential run saying, my party created this provision, which is going to boost the prospects of workers, which helped them gain leverage with their employers and generally increased economic prosperity. And that can be told to an audience that isn't closely following the details of how the policy actually shook out. But just as you pointed out, when you do have restaurants closing, when you do have workers being laid off, as opposed to sort of massive job expansion at some of these places that are affected by the policy, he can always say that the problem only related to the specifics, uh, that the council read too deeply into its mandates and pushed a little too far. Or he can just throw his hands up and avoid uh, talking in detail about the consequences of the policy at all. And so it is, in some ways, the best of both worlds for people who created this council. And I think it mirrors sort of the approach that legislatures often take to regulation in general. At the national level, we see Congress create a bunch of different administrative agencies, invest them with massive power, and so they can claim that we are totally invested in environmental regulation reducing the amount of carbon in our environment and driving America towards a clean future. But when there are negative consequences, when there are businesses that have to completely change their business model to accord with these regulations, you rarely hear the politicians who imposed these regulatory authorities actually claiming any responsibility for how these things shook out. So again, it's a cynical approach, but it's one that makes a lot of political sense for the Democrats. Thank you, Manet and Alicia. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button. Wall Street Journal members can also join Paul Jago, Kimberly Strassel, and Carl Rove for a live opinion event. Can Republicans retake Congress on Monday, October 17th at 7 p.m.? That will be in Dallas or streamed online. And for more information, go to wsjplus.com slash opinion live for tickets and more information. And as always, we'll be back here tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.